Hi everybody and welcome to heat transfer. In this video we're going to talk about how what you know about thermodynamics relates to heat transfer and in particular the nomenclature and then the way that we describe the direction of heat transfer in this class uh, versus in thermodynamics and then we'll go on to talk about the different mechanisms of heat transfer. So heat transfer, it's thermal energy that is transferred due to a temperature gradient. You have to have a temperature gradient in order to have heat transfer. If there's not a temperature gradient, you're not gonna have heat transfer and vice versa. Um, now that's something that you know from thermodynamics and it's very true that the concepts that you learned in thermos, thermodynamics still apply here. Um, but before we go forward, we need to talk about a few of the distant, uh, differences in how we deal with heat transfer in this class versus how we dealt with it in thermodynamics. For example, in thermodynamics, we refer to the heat transfer rate as Q dot, which has units of kilowatts, and the heat transfer per unit mass as little q, which would have units of kilojoules per kilogram. But in our heat transfer text, the Incorpora and DeWitt book, um, we use little q to refer to the heat transfer rate instead of q dot. Um, I don't know why, but that's just the way that the text goes. Um, it is important to note that different texts use different nomenclature. Some texts use that q dot, um, but our book does not. It just uses little q. Um, so just be aware of that if you're looking at a different text, um, that you've got different nomenclatures for different texts. Um, so in heat transfer or in thermodynamics, we talked about how we, we would define ourselves a coordinate, uh, uh, or not a coordinate system, we would define ourselves a control volume, our system, and we'd use, if we use sign convention, we said, well, heat transfer is going to be positive if it's going into the system, it's going to be negative if it's going out of the system, and we have an adiabatic process if Q is equal to zero. But in heat transfer, we acknowledge that heat transfer is a vector. It has a direction and it has a magnitude. Therefore, we need to define a coordinate system uh, when we're talking about heat transfer. By convention, it's, it's common to define heat transfer as being positive if it's going in the direction of flow. Uh, in other words, from hotter to colder. So you might want to pick your coordinate system so your Q um, kind of makes sense. So what I'm saying is this. Say you have a slab, and on one side it's hot, and on one side it's cold. Of course, hot and cold, those are relative terms, but they're there to indicate which direction that the heat is gonna flow from. Um, so it's gonna flow from hot to cold, um, as required by the second law of thermodynamics. And if we define our coordinate system such that heat is flowing in the direction of the increasing x-axis, then Q is a positive quantity. So if the magnitude were 20, kilowatt, or 20 watts here, then um, this would be a positive 20 watts uh, in the x direction. Now I could also define it like this. So I could have the left hand side, say that's the cold side and the right hand side is the hot side and that way heat is going to flow to the left in the direction of decreasing uh, the de decreasing value on the x-axis. And in that case, the heat transfer is going to be a negative number because it's going in the direction of uh, decreasing x value. Um, so that first one that we, that we talked about where we had a positive uh, Q, that would probably be a good way to define your coordinate system. You can define your coordinate system however it makes sense. Um, you just kind of want to be smart about it so it, so it makes sense. Um, Another very important thing to note is that those hot and cold surfaces here are isothermal surfaces uh, or isotherms. Um, in other words, each isotherm is at a uniform temperature. You're also going to note that the heat transfer is flowing perpendicularly uh, through those or across those or from those isothermal surfaces and the direction of heat transfer of heat flow will always be negative, uh, uh, normal, not negative, will always be normal um, to that surface. So it doesn't mean that that isothermal surface has to be a straight line. Um, it just means that the heat transfer at any location within that medium is normal to the isotherm. Now here we have what we've shown here in the diagram. We see that we've got one dimensional heat transfer so it's only in the x-axis, but most heat transfer problems in the real world are multi-dimensional. Um, and that means that in Cartesian coordinates, you'd have to define your heat transfer vector uh, as containing x, y, and z components. 
three-dimensional heat transfer is kind of outside the scope of this class, but we will talk a little bit about two-dimensional heat transfer. For example, if you've got a long beam and you can see that we've got a temperature gradient, so you'll have heat transfer occurring in the direction of decreasing temperature, and that heat transfer vector has components in the x direction and the y direction, but not the z direction because there's no temperature gradient in that z direction, which is up and down in this picture. So we've talked about um, how we refer to heat transfer with respect to the nomenclature and the direction of heat transfer, and now we're going to talk about the mechanisms of heat transfer. So in thermodynamics, we didn't really care about this, but in heat transfer, we do. Um, we're going to talk about um, conduction, so it's the first, way, first um, mechanism of heat transfer. Um, and in conduction, we have thermal energy that's transferred within a solid or a stationary fluid. Um, so it doesn't have to be a solid, it could be a fluid as long as it's not moving um, from more energetic or higher temperature molecules to adjacent lower energy or lower temperature molecules. Now once again, this heat transfer occurs in the direction of decreasing temperature. So the way that I've drawn my coordinate system, that Q would be a positive number um, because it's going in the direction of increasing X. The rate of heat transfer, the Q, is given by what's called Fourier's law. Um, so this is Fourier's law. Let's look at each of those components a little bit. Uh, we've got a negative sign, you see. Um, we also see that there's a K term, and that's the thermal conductivity, which is a property of the material uh, through which that heat is being conducted. You'll also notice the units there. It's in per terms of uh, watts per meter per one degree Celsius or Kelvin. Um, so you're talking about um, per degree, per change in, in temperature. And so since a temperature change in Kelvin and degree Celsius is exactly the same, then um, something with a thermal conductivity of 10 watts per meters Kelvin is e equivalent to saying that you've got a thermal conductivity of 10 watts per meter uh, degree Celsius. Um, so if it happens that the process that you're looking at has been occurring long enough so that, the, so that steady state conditions have been reached, so that's that SS there, and the heat transfer is one dimensional, so you've only got heat transfer in one dimension, one direction, you've only got a temperature gradient in one direction, um, this is the simplification of that temperature derivative. Um, you can assume that heat transfer is one dimensional if that uh, temperature gradient is only in one direction once again. Um, and finally, we can put that Q term in terms of this, this Q prime and alpha. So that Q, or well, it's Q double prime, um, that's the heat flux, and it has units of watts per meter squared. So we'll talk about Fourier's law in a little bit more detail later, um, but that's Fourier's law in a nutshell. In addition to conduction, we can transfer heat by convection, where heat is flowing within a fluid. Um, heat transfer is it's, uh, occurring because the fluid itself is moving. Um, and you've got a temperature gradient within that, within that uh, flowing fluid. So let's say that you've got um, a heated plate and you've got a fluid flowing by at some T infinity, and that's the temperature of the fluid in the, fl in the free stream. And when we say free stream, we mean the temperature of the fluid that's far enough away from that plate um, so that the fluid temperature isn't influenced by the temperature of the plate. Um, let's also say that the surface of the plate is hotter than the temperature of the fluid flowing over it. And because heat flows from hot to cold um, in the direction of decreasing temperature, that Q will be flowing in the positive Y direction. Newton's law of cooling is what allows us to define the heat transfer rate due to convection. Um, you'll notice that you have this variable H, which is the convective heat transfer coefficient. Notice those units. Um, <clears throat> so the units here are watts per meter squared Kelvin or watts per meter squared degree Celsius. Same kind of deal as with the thermal conductivity. 10 watts per meter squared Kelvin is exactly the same as saying 10 watts per meter squared degree Celsius. Um, unlike that thermal conductivity, uh, that, that convective heat transfer coefficient H, it's not a, a material property, it's dependent on a lot of other things, 
um, including the thermal conductivity of the fluid, but also the flow characteristics of that fluid and the geometry of whatever it's flowing over. Um, and determining that convective heat transfer coefficient, it's, it's a difficult task. Um, so for now, you're just going to be given that convective heat transfer coefficient. Um, right now, let's kind of get an idea of the range of values that you might expect for H. Uh, so here you see typical H values for fluids undergoing free convection, forced convection, and convection uh, with a phase change. So let's look at each of those. Um, forced convection, this occurs when you've got an external force like a fan or a pump causing that fluid to flow. Um, you'll also notice that for gases, the H values lower than for liquids. Um, then for free convection, this occurs uh, when that fluid flow is initiated by changes in the density gradients. Um, it's a buoyancy force driven flow. Hot air, for example, is less dense. It's lighter, therefore it rises. Um, and as it rises, fluid flow is initiated. And then finally, we can see that fluid motion can be caused by a phase change, for example, uh, maybe like during boiling, you've got gas bubbles rising in that liquid, so you've got fluid flow being initiated, or liquid water driplet, uh, liquid water, uh, or it doesn't necessarily have to be water, but liquid, drop, liquid droplets um, during condensation. And then you'll also notice that those H values during condensation and uh, boiling are very, very high. And finally, we come to the last mode of heat transfer, which is radiation. So radiation is emitted in the form of electromagnetic waves, or you can think of radiation in the form of, of packets of energy or, or particles. All matter emits radiation. Thermal radiation is emitted because a body is above absolute uh, zero or zero Kelvin. So as you can see on this electromagnetic spectrum, the range of wavelengths for thermal radiation, it's anywhere between 0.1 microns and 100 microns. And then within that span between about 0.4 and 0.7 microns, the uh, that's the visible region, and that's where you can actually see thermal radiation. For example, um, you can, if you look at uh, this coil on a stove, if it's at zero degrees, uh, zero degrees, 100 degrees Celsius, you wouldn't be able to tell that it's hot because you, unless you touched it, but you couldn't tell just by looking at it. However, once the temperature gets up to 500 degrees Celsius, that coil is going to glow. And that's the visible thermal uh, radiation. Um, so you know that thermal radiation is, for this coil right here, you know it's, it's between 0.4 and 0.7 microns, probably closer to 0.7 microns since it's glowing kind of orangish red. And then unlike conduction and convection, you don't need an inter intervening medium. You don't need molecules in between to transfer that energy. It occurs best, in fact, if, it is, if you do have a perfect vacuum. The rate equation that we're going to use is the Stefan-Boltzmann law. Um, so let's look at this equation. And as we look at it, we're going to look at figure 1.6 from the text. So you can see this, um, this E right here. This is the heat flux emitted by a real surface. So flux being in terms of watts per unit area. Um, so it's emitted by the heat flux emitted by a real surface. In other words, a surface that's less than that of a black body. So a black body is the perfect emitter of thermal radiation. That emissivity, uh, this little epsilon guy, he's the uh, kind of the cor uh, correction factor. If it's one, the surface is a black body. Um, further away from black body behavior, the more uh, poorly that surface emits and the, le uh, the, the closer to zero, I guess you get, although it's not gonna go all the way to zero, but. Um, the farther away from one that you're going to get. Um, and then finally, we have this Stefan Boltzmann constant, um, and that's a constant that will just be given to you on your equation sheet. Um, we also see that we've got this term G, if you look in the figure 1.6. Um, because radiation is emitted by all objects above absolute, temp uh, absolute, rate, um, absolute zero, um, radiation could be incident from, from other things, other sources, um, on that surface that you're looking at. 
It could be from the sun or for, from some other object. And for now, we don't really care about what that source is, but we just care that it's incident on the surface. And that incident radiation is called irradiation, and that's G. Um, note that in your book, once again, G and E are both in units of watts per unit area, watts per meter squared or whatever. They're heat fluxes. Um, now, just because that radiation is, is incident on the surface, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's absorbed by the surface. Um, so any, and that's that G-A-B-S, little subscript A-B-S, um, any of that, um, any of that absorbed radiation is going to increase the um, thermal energy of that material, uh, while any radiative uh, heat emitted by the material will decrease the thermal, uh, thermal energy of the material. Um, and this, the, the amount of, uh, or the ratio, what is it? The fraction, that's what I'm looking for. The fraction of that irradiation that's absorbed by the surface is given by this absorptivity. Um, the absorptivity, it goes from zero to one, um, and it depends on the surface itself as well as the, um, the source of that irradiation. But for now, just know that that, at, that absorptivity will be given to you. Um, both of these terms here, the heat emitted and the heat absorbed due to thermal radiation, those are both going to contribute to the thermal energy of the material. And we're gonna talk about surface balances soon, but just know that both of those are going to factor in to, the, um, to that surface energy balance. So the Q emitted minus the Q absorbed is going to be the net amount of radiation heat transfer from the surface. <clears throat> a special case is where you have a small surface surrounded by a large surface, and a large isothermal surface like the walls of a furnace or, or the walls of a room where the sur surface emissivity is taken to be equal to that of the absorptivity. And in, mo in many practical applications, um, those two terms, the emissivity and the absorptivity are equal. Um, if you come pro across a problem like this, if, you're, if you are meant to assume otherwise, that those two things are not equal to one another, you'll be told. Um, it can be shown, and we're not gonna show it here, um, we can show this in chapter 12 and we are not there yet, um, but it can be shown that the rate of radiation incident on the surface is approximately equal to the radiation emitted by a black body at that surrounding temperature. Um, and therefore, when we look at the net rate of, heat, of uh, radiation heat transfer from the surface, we can see that we have this nice simple equation. Um, and then you can also put that in terms of, of, of heat flux here. Um, so Q double prime, and we'll put a little RAD just to indicate that we're talking about radiation. And then finally, you'll notice um, in the text that we often ignore radiation effects when we have um, forced convection involved, especially when that emissivity, that little epsilon, is low and the temperatures are moderate. And that's just because um, heat transfer due to forced convection is going to typically outweigh any radiation effects. So, um, well, I guess that's it. Um, in the next video, in video 2.1, we're going to delve a little bit more deeply into Fourier's law as we talk more about conduction. Um, so thank you for watching, and let me know if you have any questions.